Theodore Patterson, prisoner number 03812-145 is dead. He died on St. Valentine's Day, 1996. Uh, he had hepatitis that caused his body to basically break up. Not to put too fine a point on it, he died in an outside hospital, gagging and eventually strangling on his own blood. Nobody claimed his body since it seemed that his family had left the... Uh, gosh, damn flies. Uh, nobody, including his family, could have cared less about him. Uh, the government had a contract to dispose of dead bodies of unclaimed convicts with the local funeral home. In Patterson's case, he was dumped in an unmarked grave in the far west end of Resurrection Cemetery near Springfield, Missouri. I spoke with the caretaker there. He said that the, the funeral home, Walnut Lawn Limited, got rid of the unclaimed corpse in a special area that is out of the way and the dead there are not mourned and forgotten by everybody. The spot reminds me of where they put soldiers executed by order of court-martial near Dachau. It's out of sight, hidden by an unkempt brush and trees. The caretaker seems to have pity on the forgotten and lost souls there. He might have uh, felt different about Patterson if he knew him like I did. I, for one, will not miss him. Wherever, uh, over to the right of this photo, uh, behind the photographer is where he and dozens of his fellow forgotten humanity will spend eternity together. This is the fate that awaits most of the long-term sentenced career criminals. The public has no idea the vast amount of forgotten convicts there are. Some people think criminals are a group that is celebrated and famous. This is a misconception that I'd like to correct in the minds of the public. Prisoners like Alexander Solzhenitsyn said in his book, The Gulag Archipelago. He compared the Gulag prison system in the Soviet Union to a group of islands in a sea. While I'm not comparing the U.S. federal prison system to the Gulags, I do feel its comparison to an archipelago is appropriate. We are a closed society. The men who are famous there are never heard of on the outside of our fence. Patterson was well known. When I published his photo to, uh, and uh, showed it to my friends, several of them knew him right away. Even people who worked at other prisons knew him. Most of you will not recognize him or know his story. I honestly believe that without this video, he would be utterly forgotten. There are literally thousands like him that you will never hear about. I employ, implore you viewers to believe that crime's fruit is not about fame, riches, three-piece suits, and eating steaks and fine cigars, you know, with, for dessert. Patterson started his federal criminal career by robbing a couple of banks in the Chicago area in 1978. He caught two consecutive 25-year sentences on 12 January 1979. Yes, that means he got 50 years in prison. That does not mean he was going to serve 50 years in prison. The 50 years is only the sentence from the court. He could have made parole in 1987. That wouldn't have been unusual. But, because he couldn't conform, he just kept racking up more time. This started even before he was sentenced. While waiting for sentencing on the 16th of August 1978, at a quarter to four in the afternoon, Patterson attacked one of the guards at the Metropolitan Detention Center in Chicago. I can tell you from experience, attacking one of my fellow guards is not looked upon with kindness. It's the best way I know of to get acquainted with pain. It seems that Patterson bought some stuff from the commissary. Ten minutes after he checked his stuff, he went back to his cell, and then he came back and, and told the officer he was shortchanged. Patterson was told the policy is to check your stuff immediately in front of the officer and make any complaints then, not ten minutes later after you've returned from your cell. Sounds like he was trying to scam the guy out of some free Doritos, me. When he was told that he wouldn't get any free stuff, he kicked over the table that had other prisoners' commissary on it and punched the officer in the face. He then got himself dragged off to the hole for his trouble. This act of stupidity also sealed his fate. The FBI investigated the incident, turned it over to the U.S. Attorney's Office 
for the Northern District of Illinois for prosecution. To make a long story short, he got another 18 months for assault on a law enforcement officer to be served after his 50 year sentence. Now it looked like he'd be locked up until 2012, not the original 1987. The prison took a month's good time and gave him 30 days in the hole. Patterson said he was angry because he had legal troubles and he overreacted and he was sorry he attacked anybody. In Chicago, he destroyed government property in an attempt to hide contraband on the 29th of September 1978. This was a big deal since it looked like he was trying to hide a weapon. His history of attacking guards for even small offenses was concerning. Perhaps next time he attacked, it'd be a knife in the heart. His excuse of he didn't know a thing about it fell on deaf ears. The prison investigator said he was trying to make everybody believe he was an angel and he would never damage anything purposely. On May 24, 1979, Patterson refused to clean a floor properly. He did such a crappy job that the officer in charge told him to do it again. Patterson said he knew how to clean a floor and it was good enough. So rather than just clean the floor, he went to the hole for 15 days. Prison is a very clean place. We keep them busy by cleaning above and beyond what they're used to doing on the outside. This keeps down the rodents and insects as well as it gives the inmates something to do. After all, I would rather that they, uh, you know, clean something rather than plan murder and escape. What may sound like a simple thing to a member of the public takes on a greater meaning inside prison. Don't judge the behaviors of individuals in prison by your standards. Your normal behaviors might get you killed behind the fence. In July of the same year, Patterson was caught doing one of the most uh, disruptive acts there are in prison. He was conducting a gambling pool. Convicts love to gamble to have some kind of excitement, but the problem is that they get into debt. Some convicts feel that if they are owed a debt, that the debtor has to pay with cash or other goods, or in the case of default, he can give up his life. This is a major cause of murder behind the fence. Drugs is another major uh, cause of murder. So much for victimless crimes, huh? Now, Patterson, for his part, he didn't know how all the, the those betting slips came into his possession and that the staff was picking on him for no reason. The officer had found gambling paraphernalia on him twice and attempted to handle it um, on the side of C block without the lieutenant. When they locked him up for investigation, the receiving officer in the segregation unit said he had an arrogant, uncooperative attitude. This stunt got him 60 days in the hole. This brings out a point. An officer can informally handle incidents in his unit. I did this for a lot of minor rule infractions. There's no reason to clog the system with paperwork to take care of simple things I can do myself. This benefits the convict as well. It doesn't look good when he goes up to the parole board if his jacket is flow overflowing with these minor infractions. If he agrees and performs the task, uh, the incident is forgotten. It, if he does not agree or refuses to perform the assigned task, then I write an incident report and we go through the formal process of punishment. I also write incident reports if the convict has been given a chance to modify behavior, but he continues with the same thing over and over. This is what happened with uh, when the officer wrote up Patterson. He'd been doing the same thing over and over. He had two chances to stop it, and when caught a third time, he blamed everybody for picking on him. He deserved 60 uh, days in solitary to take time away from uh, his cell house and give him a chance to think about his future conduct. Any normal person, this would have resulted in a change. But Patterson would only respond to immediate punishment. Give him a break or show him any compassion. It's only an avenue for him to take advantage of you. I know he did it to me every time I didn't enforce every rule to its fullest extent. After Patterson got out of the hall, he convinced the administration of USP Marion that he had learned his lesson and would not be a problem anymore. 
How the higher-ups in a prison like Marion can be so naive is beyond my comprehension. With his new attitude, he was transferred to USP Atlanta, a maximum security federal prison in Georgia, where he was promptly caught playing poker and keeping track of the winnings on a sheet of paper. When caught, an officer ordered Patterson to give him the gambling slip, but he tore it up and threw it on the floor. A couple of weeks later, he was loafing, and when told to go get back to work, he sassed the guard. Despite what he told them at Marion, his attitude hadn't changed at all. He felt nobody had the right to tell him what to do. Patterson felt that just a fist was enough to enforce his attitude. He knew that he was more or less helpless against the staff when they ordered him to comply with the rules. In February of 1980, he decided he needed a knife to make sure nobody would tell him what to do. About this time, he started using the interviewer's drugs that would give him the hepatitis that would kill him. He got caught with a weapon and a syringe and got a 45-day stretch in the hole. He could uh, use the needle with a deadly disease in it if he damn well pleased. Good move. You showed us who's boss. I'd like to point out that this knife was found by an observant officer. It is a correctional officer's job to constantly search for contraband. We do this by looking into a convict's cells and work areas. In my cell house, I like to be sure that every, every convict had his cell searched every week. This does not make me a popular officer with the thugs, but it does keep all of us safer by reducing the amount of drugs and weapons available. I'd also like to stop inmates at random in the hallway and search their persons. If they objected, I would take them to an area used for the purpose and visually search them. That means that the convict takes off all his clothes and I search them one at a time in a careful manner. I also look at every inch of the skin the convict has and inside his mouth and ears, even his hair. This is just a part of my daily routine. Before you ask, I didn't enjoy searching people and property all day every day, but I understand that getting stabbed would be a lot less pleasant. After the weapons incident, Patterson was sent to USP Terre Haute, where he decided to participate in a group demonstration and work strike 28 August 1980. He claimed that he would not, or he could not work, or the other inmates would murder him. He got out of the charge of demonstration as a group, but was punished for refusing to work. I really can't work out the thinking there, but it's, it's all history now. The very next day, Patterson was caught with a $10 bill he tried to hide uh, from the officer by keeping it inside of a matchbook. The officer decided to search Patterson when he returned from his job at the prison plumbing shop. This is how and why he found the bill. As I said before, this was and is a common practice in high security prisons. In those days, convicts were allowed to smoke and have matches, but currency was forbidden in a penitentiary. People wonder how inmates can set fires and make bombs while in prison. The answer is that we give them all the stuff they need to uh, make life hell for the, those of us that work there. Since then, somebody decided that smoking was unhealthy and it has been banned. Uh, I can't wait till uh, some idiot decides to let them vape. Uh, the punishment for the $10 bill possession was to take 25 days of Patterson's good time. Since he would never come close to living till 2012, this was just a bullshit fake punishment. I have no idea why they even bothered. It looks good on paper, but in reality it's meaningless. This type of stuff is what I personally find the most frustrating part of my job. They believe that Patterson, they believe Patterson's story that the officer did not find the money, but that he turned it over to him. To reward him for lying, he was given a light punishment. Convicts are given negative reinforcement all the time. We make our own monsters, then release them to the street. On September 13, 1980, Patterson attacked another inmate over the score of a tennis game. He was beating the inmate without the use of a weapon and had to be restrained by the guards. The other inmate did not fight back, but tried to get away from Patterson, who pursued him to continue his assault until prevented by guards. This was a pattern I noticed. The man had an explosive temper, and at the best of times, he was just plain old angry and hateful. 
If he didn't get his way with anything, no matter how slight, he would resort to violence. I think this personally was what made him such an effective member of the Aryan Brotherhood when I met him. All his gang had to do was wind him up and he'd go off like a bomb. Or, as he later did, set off a bomb. The gang used him to commit violent acts while they remained blameless. Patterson was a fool in that respect. Not a great warrior as he claimed to be. He was uh, the kind of convict that had a tennis racket in his hand, but he didn't strike Patterson during the assault. The, the presence of the racket was the reason Patterson said he had to attack the men because he feared that he would be hit by it. The guards who saw the assault said the other guy never attempted to hit anybody. He got 14 days in the hole for assault and they took another 30 days, a good time. Here's a good place to establish that each time Patterson gets into trouble he makes an excuse. He does all he can to deflect responsibility for his action onto others. This is the main reason I do not fall for the excuse of convicts or people in the free world uh, who use excuses for their misconduct. But it is an effective strategy. I've seen people get away with all kinds of outrageous things by making the flimsiest of excuses. You should hear what some lawyers expect a court to believe. The sad part is, is that sometimes it works. And it works far too often. When convicts leave the yard in a mass movement at the end of a recreation period, it is common practice to search them by patting them down. This is an area where fights break out and serious assaults and stabbings occur. USP Terre Haute, Indiana, is a place that has a very large recreation yard. 16 November 1980, at about a quarter to three in the afternoon, a lieutenant and some of the officers he was supervising set up at the entrance to the east yard or east side yard number three. They were conducting pat searches of all the inmates as they left the yard to go back to their cell houses. Patterson was on this yard and was going back to I up cell number four on the east range. I can't say for sure but it seems reasonable that Patterson was getting involved with gang activity at this time. The officers had some trouble with a convict who did not want to be searched. As part of a gang Patterson, who had to support the man or face the wrath of the gang. Um, when the lieutenant turned his back, Patterson jumped on the lieutenant's back and started to strangle him. While the lieutenant fought off his potentially deadly attack, the other officers had their hands full with other convicts who were pushing and shoving them. As luck would have it, one officer noticed that his supervisor was in trouble and used the force required to subdue Patterson. That's how we put it. He was cuffed and dragged to the hole again by several guards. They took all his good time, about six months, for this incident. The lieutenant felt that Patterson should be prosecuted and given more time in prison for trying to kill him. There was no referral to the FBI because the administration felt that it would not serve the interests of the institution and that a reduction in the charges were warranted. The administration of the prison felt that by attacking the lieutenant it would jeopardize the impending transfer of Patterson to Lompoc, California, and that Patterson wouldn't do that. It seems that a transfer to California was a very desirable thing. They believed the convict more than they believed the staff. Patterson got his transfer, and the taking of good time was a slap on the wrist for trying to strangle a lieutenant but they did have to take some action, so the forfeiture of good time meant nothing to Patterson, and that's what they did. This kind of crap is what makes the employees of BOP angry and frustrated with the system. Rather than hammer this guy, they just transfer him to make him somebody else's problem. This attitude is what allows people who should be in prison to make parole. The administration would rather make the problem go away rather than do something to fix it. I have no doubt that this type of incident that made some of my supervisors callous assholes who thought of nothing but promotion no matter what it hurt. The system treated them like crap, so they just passed it on. Crap rolls downhill, as they say. 
Emboldened by the lack of consequences, when Patterson was given his transfer to USP Lompoc, California, he displayed an attitude that he would get what he wanted as soon as he wanted it. When he arrived at his new cell house on the last day of 1980, he couldn't be bothered to wait for his cell assignment. The officer was busy at 5.30 in the evening with other convicts when Patterson arrived, and he told him it'd be a few minutes till he assigned him a cell. Patterson lost it and verbally attacked the officer. He went on a profane screaming fit and refused to calm down. There was no way some guard was going to make him wait. After all, he's the man who tried to choke to death a supervisor at his last, institu last institution and nothing happened. Why should he bother to obey a mere guard? Patterson was somebody who could not be bothered to be inconvenienced by anybody. The BOP had done a good job of making a monster. The frustrating part is the people who make the monster is never the ones who have to suffer the consequences. He was given 15 days segregation, but it was suspended, meaning that if he had clear con conduct for three months, he'd receive no punishment at all. The problem with an inmate acting in a manner like this is twofold. One, he is out of control and needs to learn to get his emotions under control. If people act like a screaming lunatic every time they have to wait for a few seconds, imagine how often assaults would occur. The other is more important reason is that the convict gets worked up by such outbursts. And the other convicts, they, they lose control of themselves. And I can lose control of a cell house in a matter of seconds if one of the convicts gets the rest of all the thugs worked up. Emotion can sweep a group of people in a very short time. Fear and hate can cause a group to act in ways they would norm, not normally act if there wasn't a spark to get them going. I have fed a cell block and the last three inmates think their fish is frozen and start yelling about it. Suddenly, everybody in the cell block has frozen fish. They think it's frozen because it's not steamy. Therefore, it's frozen because somebody else has frozen fish, or at least says he does. No amount of reasoning will talk this group out of the fallacy of their positions. They insist I am lying even if they can feel the fish is warm. All reason can leave a group in a very short time. On the outside, this may not have the consequences it does behind the fence. I'm sure prison riots have started in this manner. Speaking of riots, Patterson, 90 days after he got the last incident, decided to start this crap again. He was stopped by an officer working in Charlie unit when he tried to enter the unit. Patterson refused to answer why he wanted in the unit. When the officer went to the phone to report Patterson out of place, he was attacked by Patterson by grabbing the phone and hitting the officer with it. After that, he attacked several guards with hands, fists, and feet. He told one guard that he would stab him to death in less than six months or suck his dick. This time he got locked up in the special housing or I unit. On the way to the hole, Patterson kicked a guard in the groin and leg several times. He got slammed on the floor and put in handcuffs to get him under control. It was after they helped him up, he kicked the unit manager in the crotch. As soon as he got to I unit, or the hole as we call it, he went berserk and got a bunch of other inmates to act up as well. They threw food trays at the guards and busted the windows in the place. Not a great situation to be in a riot with prisoners with broken glass. Patterson and the other inmates of I unit clogged up their toilets and started continuously flushing them. This caused the toilets to overflow and about two inches of shit, piss, and water covered the, uh, all the bottom floors of the cell block. It took a few hours of overtime to get the place back in control. Why did Patterson cause all this ruckus? Well, he uh, didn't get his shampoo as soon as he thought he should. The fact that he just got locked up for assaulting an officer who caught him out of bounds was beside the point. This is a pretty good reason to start a riot in a cell house. The witnesses said Patterson was drunk on hooch when all this took place. The part I find most telling is the obvious staff concern for their fellow staff. The fight was not the issue, but the possibility that action would be taken against the officers and other staff that helped subdue the out-of-control inmate. 
the very carefully documented, they very carefully documented all the facts of the situation to show that, oh, no, unnecessary force was used. That the convict was going all he could to injure staff. The fact that the guards were only trying to defend themselves against physical attack. This tells me that the staff was very concerned with being accused of wrongdoing. This is exactly the type of attitude that gets guards killed. Cops too, for that matter. If you're scared to use force to protect yourself and others, it is easy to let the situation get out of control. First is one inmate, then two, then the next thing, the entire cell block. This was one of the situations of one of the prison riots I was in. The reluctance of staff to use the force necessary to maintain order can be the difference between a minor incident nobody ever hears about to seeing the local prison on the national news engulfed in flames and smoke. Another thing about this incident is alcohol. Many times I have had comments about people who think that alcohol is not a problem in prison. Most of the major incidents and riots I've been involved with were fueled by alcohol. The convict makes this stuff that looks like vomit soup. Sometimes they strain it, but most of the time they drink it just the way it is. Now and then it's so rotten it makes them sick. But it is a constant nuisance to track down and eradicate. Drunk inmates are twice as bad to deal with. I can attest that as a cop, about half the people I arrested were under the influence of alcohol. I suspect they wouldn't have done the thing I arrested them for if they hadn't been drinking. Once this included a murder a drunk young man did when he killed his own mother in the home they shared. It's one of the reasons I don't drink at all. I do enough stupid stuff without liquid stupidity. 26th of May 1982, he was found with another weapon hidden in his cell. He claimed to know nothing about it. He blamed it on some other unnamed inmate who must have put it in his cell when nobody was looking. 14 July 1982, he was found in an unauthorized area. He was told not to return. A few minutes later, the guard caught him sneaking back in. Patterson said he was not sneaking, but just walking, not where he was supposed to be. He never sneaks. 30 December 1982, an officer stopped Patterson in the hall and patted him down. He filled an object in his pocket and ordered Patterson to give it to him. Patterson took a hash pipe out of his pocket and threw it down the hallway. The officer retrieved it and took Patterson to the hall. March 18, 1983, when stopped for a pat down, Patterson became enraged and started cussing at the staff in the area. He told them to do things with themselves I don't think are possible. He had been uh, working in a paint shop that day. They gave him a week in a hole for acting the fool. He claims the guards were picking on him again and that he wanted to be transferred to Leavenworth. Because he was becoming such a management problem, Patterson was fired from his job in a paint shop. His new job was the F unit orderly. That meant a pay cut, and all he did was clean stuff during, you know, all day long. Angered by the demotion, he decided to act out again. He was watching TV in K unit, when the 6 p.m. count was called, he refused to go to a cell to be counted. He was also out of bounds by being in K unit as his unit was F. Convicts are not allowed to be in the cell blocks they're not assigned to. He got locked up for refusing an order and interfering with the count. When asked why he refused to move, he, uh, he said, I got nothing to say on the matter. They kept him in the hole for 15 days. When his time was up, Patterson refused to leave the segregation unit. He said he wanted to be transferred to another prison, but nobody on his unit team would help him. He decided to stay in segregation until he was transferred. He only stayed another two weeks, then went to lower I. He uh, now had no job since he refused to do anything he was told. 28 May 1983, at 8.30 in the morning, he was let out of a cell with another convict. It was routine to let two cons out at a time for a shower. Patterson told the officer he was only going to let out a particular inmate and no other inmate when he came out to shower. The officer let out the next in line and Patterson had a fit of anger and threatened to beat the officer. A team came to the unit and off to the hole Patterson went after a shower, of course. The officer reported that Patterson was going to pick his recreation partner or he would attack the officer and quote, jack him up. He got 30 days in the hole for this. About this time, it seems that Patterson was getting heavily involved in the Aryan Brotherhood. He wanted 
to only be in the same room with AB members and would cause trouble if the prison staff did not cooperate with his demands. While in the hole, Patterson started to group up with the AB. He and they put pressure on other convicts to cause problems for the guards. Patterson was bodybuilding and was also used by the gang to try and intimidate the staff. This came to a head on the morning of June the 7th. Patterson and his gang were going to be moved and split up to separate areas of the cell block. He had been housed in cell L10, which is on the bottom ranges of I unit. When informed of the move, Patterson said, come in and make me. Two guards took him up on the offer. They opened the cell door and the fight was on. Since it was two to one, Patterson ended up face down and cuffed. He got his ass dragged up the stairs and thrown into cell C11, which is on the upper tier of the cell block. Patterson was not happy with his treatment and whined and cried about it, but his protestations fell on deaf ears. As you may have heard before, he could do it the easy way or the hard way. He made his choice, but it did make him look tough in front of his new friends, the ABs. For trying to show how tough he was, he got another 60 days added to his time in the hole. By now, he had no more good time to take. It looked like he intended to do every day of his 51 and a half year sentence. The ABs were having a real push at USP Lompoc, California at the time. As a good little soldier, Patterson did all he could to help disrupt the prison and assert the dominance of the ABs. The guards did all they could to separate and disrupt the lines of communication of the gang at the prison. To that end, after just four, after the four o'clock shift change, the guards were going to move one of the ABs off A range in I unit and away from Patterson. This he could not tolerate. Patterson threw his food tray and most of the stuff in his cell out of his bars and onto the tier. He started the old flood the cell block trick, but the staff shut off his water. Now all he could do was scream in rage as the buddy was removed from the range. He went berserk inside his small cell for hours with no effect. Finally exhausted, he could only sit on his bed surrounded by what little of his destroyed property he had left. I'm sure the guards thought it was funny that the idiot in rage and frustration could only cause himself more misery. I know that's what I thought when I seen him do the same sort of things. He got an extension of 15 days to his time in the hole. His broken and torn up property was picked up off the tier by the guards and thrown away. 12 days later, he did essentially the same thing when more of his AB buddies were removed from his range and I unit. He just stood like a, a child having a tantrum screaming he wanted to go with them. He must have been getting pretty low on property by this time. Perhaps he threw some toilet paper and splashed some toilet water around. His memberships in the ABs seem not to be peeing off very well with luxurious living. Some comments I get on this channel is that the ABs are super cool guys who live much better than the average inmate is just plain wrong. Membership in the AB only leads to longer sentences and doing harder time. In the end, it leads to an early unmarked grave in a field forgotten by almost everyone. But if you want to believe that the criminal organization membership is all about high living and glamour, then just stay tuned. It gets better than this. For the tantrum, he was graciously allowed to stay in the hole an additional 15 days. Frustrated with not getting his way, Patterson decided to take it out on the guards. 24 July 1983, he was handed his lunch tray at 11.15 a.m. Without warning, he threw it at the guard and also threw an apple. The tray hit the guard in the back when he was not looking and the apple hit him in the foot when he was unable to get out of the way in time. Patterson started screaming he were all pigs and assholes over and over. Convicts who are impotent, impotent to do anything often take the rage out by throwing their food trays. This results in them getting only the bare essentials to survive as nobody wants to give them more ammunition to throw at us. People who are like Patterson never seem to learn that continued violent behavior only results in more restrictions on their freedom and the amount of property that they are allowed in their cells. Strange thing is, Patterson isn't stupid, or he wasn't stupid, I should say. He seems to have, you know, a slightly below average IQ, but he wasn't stupid by a long shot. Perhaps he thought he could just wear the system down. I'm here to tell you, that's a losing strategy every time. 
not uh, convinced, the very next day, he, at half past seven in the evening, Patterson decided to flood the cell house again. He called on all of his uh, AB buddies to join him and they all threatened the other inmates to join in or face the wrath of the gang. It didn't work because the guards heard the ruckus and simply shut the water off. The thugs got to, to smell their own shit for the rest of the night. It has been my experience the best way to flood a cell block is to quietly arrange for everybody to start at the same time without alerting the guards. Even better, wait till they are on another tier before everyone starts flushing. That way they get a head start. I've seen uh, two or three inches of water flowing down the stairs in this waterfall of pissy water and you know the occasional log turd rolling along in it but it seems Patterson and his friends were either too stupid to do it right or were too angry to think straight in any case didn't do any good and Patterson got another 15 days in the hole for his trouble the next evening Patterson and company tried the exact same thing with the exact same results the only difference was the last time he did it he he said it was all a lie and he didn't do anything of the kind. This time he said no plea when asked if he tried to flood the range. And at least his sense of humor was undamaged. By now, Patterson had racked up enough time to spend the rest of 1983 in the hole. He planned his next flooding more carefully. While the officers were uh, moving recreation at 9 in the morning on 3 December, Patterson put his plan into action. He and everyone on the range had suffered you know, stuff, all their sheets into the toilets and, and that clogged them up really good and tight. When the officers were off the tier they started flushing for all they were worth. By the time the officers knew something was wrong a torrent of water was pouring down from the stairs. By the time they got the water shut off the entire cell block every one of the four ranges had an inch or two of water on it. Water was pouring down the stairs and any object on the floor was soaked with, you know, water, urine, feces. The guard's boots became soaked with the stuff and one guy slipped and fell. Ugh. He fell and was coated from head to toe on his entire back. It was a mess. For leading this mini revolt, he got another 30 days in the hole. 17 February 1984, Patterson went out of the hole and back in F unit and cell B4. Back to being hateful, he threw the salt and pepper shaker into his toilet and flushed it. The captain threatened to put him back in a hole for a couple weeks if he did any more stupid stuff like that. He stayed out of trouble for some time after that. He even got his desired transfer to Leavenworth. About this time he got a new attitude. He decided that he'd not accept anything from the authorities. It was his thinking that they punished him by taking things away that he valued. If he had nothing but the essentials, then there was nothing that could be taken from him. He started sleeping on the bare floor of his cell with no blanket. He bought nothing at the commissary. All he did was participate in gang activities. I don't know for sure, but I'd be, I would wager he gave his non-essentials to the other members of the gang to curry favor with him. He even got his old job back by working in the paint shop. The guards did have to tell him not to put the trash bags on the bars of his cell. He put a bag at the very bottom of the bars to keep the draft off him at night. After being warned about it, he continued to sleep on the concrete floor without the bags, draft or not. He sure showed us. I can assure you that his discomfort did not bother a single guard for a second. In prison, if you want to act like an idiot, you're free to do so. And yeah, it's going to look like it's going to start raining. July 28, 1986 at Leavenworth, Patterson and another thug got in a fist fight in a chow hall. This is a common area to start beating and stabbing each other. I never like to work the chow hall for this reason. In any case, the two thugs tried to beat and stomp each other, but the guards made them quit and dragged them both to the hole. The ABs just stood by and did nothing to help Patterson, so it must have been a personal beef he had. When asked what issue was, Patterson refused to say, the same with the other thug. So at this late date, they're both dead and buried, I guess. Uh, nobody will ever know what it was about. Like it mattered anyway. September 9th, 1986, Patterson was playing cards with some suckers. 
Patterson had done pretty good and had taken the other three men to the cleaners. The F a cell block officer entered the number two gallery card room and told everybody to stand up so he could shake them down. Patterson had $26.25 on him. That's over the $20 limit they're allowed to have back in those days. Uh, the officer kept the $625, finished his pat downs and search of the room and left. At the end of the shift, the guard dropped off the $6.25 with the shift lieutenant along with the receipt for the money. Patterson got a copy of the receipt and asked for his money back. It was donated to the inmate expense fund. He was warned not to have excess funds in the future. Now we all know that there was gambling going on and that is a prohibited act. But unless one of the thugs tells you he is gambling or they are keeping track on paper, it's impossible to prove. The most you can do is take any excess money that the winner accumulates. Near the end of 86, Patterson was using a lot of heroin. This is the drug of choice with the ABs. He was sharing not only his needles with his brothers, but his hepatitis. It's my opinion that he helped shorten a few lives, uh, you know, a few of their lives, as well as his own with this disease. He got caught with his bloody needle a few times. The problem I find is when searching for intravenous drug paraphernalia, it's easy to get stuck. I had a pair of gloves that I had a fine mesh of Kevlar in to help protect me from needle sticks. I have no idea if they worked or not as I wore them all the time when searching, but I was still very careful not to jam a needle into my hand, gloves or not. They were a very nice looking pair of black leather gloves and I still have them. I also wore them uh, a lot at work for the reason that they had Kevlar in them. When I was a cop, I noticed that some murder victims had deep defense wounds on their hands. Keep that in mind, uh, I thought that if I was attacked with a sharp object, I might be able to put up a little better fight if I could avoid injury to my hands like the murder victims I remembered. I thought about making sure I took every advantage I could. See, I'm only five foot nine, and I never weighed more than 150 pounds when I work. So I needed every advantage that I could that, that was possible. Patterson was hanging around the ABs, but he still hadn't made his bones. What this means is that he hadn't killed anybody for the gang. To be a full member of the Brotherhood, you have to kill somebody they want dead. Until you do a murder, you're not a, really a member. The victim could be another thug that owes the gang money, somebody who showed an AB disrespect, even one of us guards. Given his orders, uh, Patterson got high and armed himself with a homemade knife we call a shank. At almost 5.30 in the evening of 27 September 1986, Patterson spotted his victim on the main recreation yard at USP Leavenworth, Kansas. Patterson's honored up to his victim and then, without warning, plunged a shank into the guy's chest. The victim took off running with Patterson in hot pursuit. He managed to get close enough to stab the man a few more times before the guards brought him down. He was disarmed, cuffed, and dragged to the hole. His intended murder victim had several serious stab wounds that required emergency medical treatment. He didn't die, but it wasn't for lack of trying on Patterson's part. The AB was pleased. He had shown he could follow orders to kill. The AB kept Patterson supplied with heroin while he was in the hole. The gang couldn't get him out but they could help him pass the time in a haze of drug-addled mind. You know, not my preferred way to spend the weekend, but eh, each his own, right? Patterson got deeper and deeper in with the brand, as they call it, yet he still hadn't killed for the gang. Must have been pretty frustrating to be so close and yet unable to become a full member. This is the point I'd like to make here. When I talk about gang membership, I am normally talking about full members. At this point in time, Patterson could have been considered a close associate of the group, but not yet a full member. This means he takes orders, but he doesn't give them. He's their bitch to do with as they please. If they tell him to kill, he just asks who. If uh, he gets his ass beaten, the gang may or may not do anything about it. Depends on if the insult is to the gang or just the bitch Patterson. Life is hard at the bottom rung of the ladder of a prison gang. 
Since Patterson had attacked an officer and destroyed property even before he was sentenced, it was felt that he should be sent to USP Marion where his attitude could be modified. It is rare that convicts start out attacking guards. Getting sent to Marion is considered a punishment. It is. For those rare individuals who continue to buck the system at Marion, the BOP has a program of behavior modification called the Control Unit. It's the most secure unit in the most secure federal prison in the entire nation. To say it's a Spartan place is an understatement. The afternoon of April 2nd, 1988, seemed like a good time to make his bones. It was uh, Charlie Cell Block on the BD side at USP Marion, located in southern Illinois, where I worked for 23 years. Patterson had finally worked his way up to Marion for his constant disruptive behavior. His association with the AB had earned him the transfer since there was a race war going on on the BOP, and the ABs were right in the thick of it. To try to reduce the violence, it was decided to get ABs out of the penitentiaries, and the killings did slow throughout the Bureau. But on this day, when let out for a shower, Patterson decided to make his bones once and for all. In full view of the officers, he started stabbing to death his victim. Over and over, he stuck a knife into the body of his victim while he desperately tried to run away. Followed by Patterson, stabbed. He left a bloody trail on dog range, then down the middle graded stairs and finally to the front grill on Baker Range. The uh, first guard who saw the stabbing yelled, fight, and walked the five steps to his office, picked up the phone and dialed 222. This rang an alarm in the control center located in, you know, in the center of all the four hallways of the prison. The control room officer pushed the mic button and said, attention all radio units. Attention all radio units, we have a fight in Charlie unit. Fight in Charlie. At this announcement, the prison became alive. All convicts were locked in their cells as quickly as possible. The staff that were not directly supervising convicts ran. They didn't walk, they ran as fast as they could down to Charlie house. Down the stairs and into the cell block they went. The lieutenant ordered all the convicts on the BD side to lay down or they'd be knocked down. When he judged they had enough staff on hand, he ordered the cell block officer to open the range door. The staff flooded onto the range. Each of them had a 36 inch long right baton with metal balls on the both ends called rib spreaders. They could make a nasty injury with that weapon. Patterson dropped his knife and both him and his victim lay on the cold concrete at the bottom of the cell block. Every convict was handcuffed. The victim was rushed to the hospital for treatment of his wounds. The murder investigation started by calling in the prison investigators called the SIS. It's called Special Investigative Supervisor. The FBI was notified. Evidence was collected. Photos taken. Surprisingly, the victim did not die and was back in his cell the next day. You just can't kill a thug. Uh, I should mention that the victim that day was black. Seems he did not pay a gambling debt and had earned the ire of the gang. So much for the great white warriors protecting the poor, helpless white inmates against the hordes of minorities. That is the AB's propaganda, but it's far from the truth. They kill over money, drugs, and sex. Now and then they kill a minority to get back for a slight to one of their members. The race war I was talking about here was started by the ABs because they were just plain scared of Raymond Cadillac Smith and murdered him in September of 82. Smith was a DC black and this brought on a killing war that lasted almost my entire career at Marion. July 31st of 1988, Patterson got his first chance to fight in the race war. He was locked up in I unit or the hole, you might say. He was walking on A range, which is the range next to the officer station. When he went past 10 cell, the black ends inside grabbed Patterson by the arm and tried to break it. Patterson pulled a shank from his pants, put his arm in the cell and tried to stab the black inmate, but only succeeded in putting a small cut on the guy's hand. A guard saw this and yelled at Patterson to back away from the cell and drop the knife. He threw it down the range and another inmate dragged it into his cell. It was never recovered and most likely flushed down a toilet. For this act of violence, Patterson was transferred to H unit as it was known then, 
the control unit. I have an entire video on the control unit. If you haven't watched it, I'd recommend that you do so. And the control unit is where Patterson got to be famous. It's well known by everybody who worked there at the time. All the inmates who knew uh, he was after his attacker in the control unit. It was a day I will never forget, that's for sure. When even us old guards get together, we always mention this day in the control unit. Even guards that worked at other prisons have heard of this incident. I'll explain. It was 7.30 and I was on the evening watch as the number three and G unit. I was on the upper tier, two officers, and we were running showers upstairs. It was cool and we had the windows open to let the cool air, let the humid air out of the cell block. In the summer, G unit is very hot and humid place to work, but on that October 5th day, it was actually pleasant weather for once. Outside the windows, it was a quiet night. All of a sudden, we heard an explosion. The number two officer said, "What the hell was that?" I looked at the number one. I looked at the number one and said, "That was a shotgun." The number two officer told the inmates on the range to lock up. I went to the door in the number one when the radio said, Attention all radio units. Deuces in H unit. Deuces in H unit. The number one opened the, do the unit door. I took my baton out of its ring and I ran down the hall, past the hospital and into H unit. An officer told me to go upstairs. I went up the stairs and on C range grill, I waited for more staff to respond and the lieutenant to get there. What I saw was a large amount of smoke. There was so much smoke, I couldn't see the back of the range. I could hear a screaming of an inmate who was holding his face and blood just poured between his fingers. On 9 July 2018, I made a video about this incident called Felix Delgado gets his face blown off in federal prison. In that video, I incorrectly said the date was 6 October, but that was the date that the investigation was finished, not the incident. After 30 years, I might get an exact date wrong now and then. You know, rather than repeat the entire video here, I'll just say that Theodore Patterson admitted to blowing up Delgado. Some officers say he shot Delgado and that the weapon was a zip gun. We're all talking about the same thing. I call it a bomb because it blew up and threw shrapnel like a bomb not a projectile like a bullet. Whatever it's called, they had originally charged Patterson with attempted murder but changed it to assault and possession of an explosive. This was the incident that got Patterson an undetermined time to spend at Marion. He only left about six months before he died. USP Marion has a hospital but we're unable to properly care for people that are dying. For that, a transfer is, you know, soon before your death, uh, you know, to a federal medical facility at Springfield, you know, just before you become a corpse. On the last day of 1989, Patterson was moved to B range of H unit. To show his anger, he tore up his government issued sheets. He didn't use them anyway, so why not just tear them up? On January the 8th of 1990, he was ordered to strip before being removed from his cell. He pulled something from under his mattress and flushed it out. The officer told him not to. He was in cell B11 of the control unit, still working off his time for blowing up Delgado. He was moved to dog range of the control unit when his cell number 13 was searched and they found a shank he was hiding in his hairbrush he kept on the concrete shelf above his bed. He eventually got out of the control unit, but as I said before, he only left Marion to go to Springfield. I had some of my buddies take him there. They said his belly was swollen up from what the hepatitis was doing to his liver. He got so bad at the end, uh, they sent him to an outside hospital in Springfield area for the last three weeks of his life. He was still under armed guard when he breathed his last in that hospital room. No loved ones were there to see him off, just the hospital staff and some prison guards. Taken to a funeral home and put in an unmarked grave was his final fate. He will be remembered by few and missed by none. If you like this video, hit the like button and subscribe, will ya? Thanks for watching.